question or a challenge or a thought from the entire presentation? Thank you all. My name is Jerry Silver. And uh, lots of people have counseled me on not to say what I'm about to say. <laughs> but, uh, but I'm going to say it anyway. Because I'm going to say it anyway because uh, I feel strongly about it. And uh, I, I might preface this with the fact that uh, if we had stop emitting greenhouse gases right now, aside from its amazingly disruptive effect on our economy, that the Earth would continue to warm for at least 40 or 50 years. So it's, it's, there we are, you know, and those fix are go, that, those, that equilibrium point is going to continue for many, many, many years after that. So we're, we're not out of the woods by any means. The other thing I, I wanted to say is for Gina McCarthy's talk, she talked about climate change and public health. And I'm a doctor, and I agree with her entirely about that. But there's something she didn't mention, and that is how did we get into this mess right now? Why, why is there this problem when we knew about it 30 or 40 years ago? Why is there so much poverty in this nation when at the same time there are multi-billionaires in this nation? And poverty is the cause of violence and drug addiction and fear and anxiety. Uh, all, and why is our culture going in this direction? And I think one of the answers that people haven't been talking about is the fact that we have an economy that is based on consumption, that is based on greed, that is based on uh, wanting more all the time and not being satisfied with what we have. And, and nobody has been speaking about that directly, that we have to change this basic way of this market economy that results in these things that we're seeing today. And that's a big thing because we have been uh, indoctrinated to believe that this is the best economy in the world and we're going to have progress and everything is going to be fine. And it did result in many wonderful things. But we have the capacity to deal with these problems and eliminate poverty and eliminate violence and war and all these things that are due to the fact that there's competition for resources and all these things and power and dominance and how are we going to do that? That's my question. <laughs> Somebody want to take that out? <laughs> Hello? Oh, there we go. Um, what I see is a lot of it is who is in power, we are getting to the point where we can vote. And I have to wait two years. But I believe it's really all who is in power because if we have the right people in the right mindset and the want to do the good, then we could easily turn our country around and turn and try to help other countries and just generally our own world, it's, I don't know how to word it, I had it in my mind and I'm like, oh, how do I say it? <laughs> but as of right now, the people who are in power, they're politicians and like our current president, a businessman. They're trying to get themselves more money and companies more money. They're not focusing, like in my point of view, they're not focusing on what the world needs and what the people themselves need. And so if we were to focus on helping those who need the help, those who can't do it for themselves, we'd be able to push it forward. I, I don't know if my point's going to cross yet. <laughs> So
So I think about this all the time. I mean, I really mean like all the time, like every day I think about this because I, I never like to use the word hate. I don't believe in using the word hate, but I strongly dislike capitalism. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and so I think that to break free of this, I think that first of all, because it's so hard to get um, the leaders elected unless if they have a lot, a lot of money and a lot of good people don't have a lot, a lot of money. And a lot of, I mean, Bernie Sanders also wasn't elected. That could have changed a lot of things. But anyways, what I think is in order to solve the six system, this is my personal opinion. Um, I do have a lot of reasons why it is, but I think we have to break down the system and start over, which is a very unpopular opinion. Um, very much so. Not in this room. <laughs> no, you know. um, and so I think we have to get, we basically have to start over because it seems like it's not working trying to work in this system that's against us because it's like, yes, this is a democracy, but is it really acting like it? No, because the only people that are really truly being represented are the wealthy. Truly. I don't mean like, I mean, yeah, we're said, it's said that there's more than that, but not really. So I think that basically overall consciousness has to be upgraded. It has to be raised in order for anything to change, really. So people have to be awakened. For instance, people don't know that they're slaves to the system. They don't know they're slaves to money, to greed, to all these things. They don't know they're slaves. How do they know that they're not free? How do they break free of this, basically, like, this cage and this, like, paradox unless they are aware of it? So you have to spread awareness. And um, I actually figured out that at least for me, what's a good way to do this is to show people that the reason that why they're getting so defensive that I'm saying this is because, like, then I list, like, the parts of the brain that, like, it's not going through because of, like, already this previous mindset, because of brainwashing and the brainwashing from blah, blah, blah. Eventually, you talk enough that people just shut up and listen. I've <laughs> 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 discovered this. Um, so basically, we just have to work together, and um, I realized that I can talk as much spiritual stuff, I can say what I feel from my heart, but people won't listen until I give them facts, and, and then I kind of use a little psychology. And so um, basically, we can do it, and we just have to work together, and instead of working in the system, like know that we are not a government, we are human beings, we are mammals. We always forget that we're animals. We are in fact animals. We have instincts, we have intuition, we have things that we can use at our disposal that we're not because we're told we can't for some reason or that is not okay. We do, like a border means nothing unless you give it a name, unless you define it as being part of you. I say that I pledge allegiance to the earth not to a country, and I continue to do so, so we have to change the mindset of everyone, basically. But we can do it. <laughs> we can do it. A little bit. If I can also answer this question real quick, um, I just have two points. Um, I believe that we can change the culture of consumption uh, through education uh, by starting in schools when kids are young um, because that's when people are very impressionable, you know. Um, and, you know, the earlier people learn about, you know, all these issues and, you know, options of changing their behaviors, the earlier they can start implementing them and teaching others. And, um, and I also think that it's important to lead by example. Um, I think that it's important to, you know, um, practice what you preach and to, to, you know, take on this lifestyle and then show other people and tell other people how it works and explain it to them. I really think that communication is like one of the key ways that we are going to accomplish any of this, you know? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll just add to that too. Um, that I think part of, part of the answer to that question is that there are real hard truths in, involved in that. Um, 
and, and that's part of why, like, the last time young people really did show up and vote in 2008 uh, and put Barack Obama in the White House and Democrats controlled the House, Democrats controlled the Senate, and they didn't do a thing on climate change um, and, you know, didn't, didn't really do anything different. Um, one was because the same corporate forces were actually in power controlling our government. But the other is because we're so far past We've, we've, so, we've gone so far past the limits of our natural systems that to actually bring things back into alignment involves some actual hardship. You know, like we, like our, our real economy hit its limits in the 1970s. Um, and that's when our real economy kind of failed. And we've been running on fumes ever since then and borrowing from the future and building this house of cards economy. And, and so it's, you know, I, I agree with what Chloe said, you kind of do have to break down the system because you can't disassemble a house of cards one card at a time. That's, that's why it was built this way, by, by the, the billionaire class and the Chamber of Commerce and the Reagan administration. Like, the reason they constructed this economy that was rooted in so much debt um, and so much borrowing from the future and based on the continuation of this pattern is that they knew that to undo it would actually cause real hardship for a lot of people that are dependent on that system now. Um, and, and so being honest about that, that, that we're not going to have this like glowing, rosy, Jetsons magic kind of future um, where, where everyone has abundance and everyone has everything that they could ever want, um, that, that there's actually going to you know, that we're going to have to live responsibly again. Um, and, you know, we're not going to have little hovercrafts to take us everywhere. Like, we're going to have to use our legs and like, <laughs> walk. There's going to be, um, there's going to be actual consequences um, and, and some suffering and hardship. Um, and I think we need, we need the ability to be honest about that with each other. Thank you, Tim. So I'm just going to give a bit of an answer to that question, too. I'm sure that all of us have heard that 20% of the population uses 80% of the Earth's resources. That's been around for a long time. Also, that it would take seven planet Earths for everybody to live the way that we're living. So part of the answer is we have to sacrifice, as you just said. We have to be willing to change. But that's not why it came up here. So I came, I came forward to talk a little bit about the food that you mentioned, Chloe. So in a, um, there's a project called Drawdown. Some of you may have heard of it. A book was written by Paul Hawken, and he discovered a hundred ways that we could draw down carbon out of the atmosphere, out of the water, and put it back in the earth. And two of the ways that I want to lift up have to do with food, food consumption and uh, food waste. And one third of all the food that we produce is wasted, which creates an abundance of methane and all kinds of things, plus all the resources that are used to get the food in the first place and then it's wasted. But what you said about meat is so critical and I just think that those are number three and four on his list of 100 most potent solutions to our problem. And we could all really do something about that. So I didn't really have a question, but I just wanted to lift up that particular statistic. Well, I'm here, and I am more educated now than I was when I came in. Um, I'm here. I'm. I'm. I came somewhat educated. I'm more educated now, and I'm going home to my neighborhood and to my church. And how do I get people out to events? How do I light the fire in my church, in my town? How do I get them who are knowledgeable, who are aware, but they're not committed? How do we change that? tomorrow, when I go home, how do I get people to come out? 
I think um, Gina McCarthy gave us um, a good sense of that when she talked about first making it personal um, and also um, giving people solutions. So if you're dealing with a community that's very aware and educated, the way to start is to have a real concrete thing we want to do X in our community. Maybe it's you want to pressure the town to do town composting, where they would come and pick up composting along with their recycling and trash. Or maybe you want to ban um, plastic, um, plastic bags in your, in your county. These are things that are being done in municipalities around the country. Maybe you want to ban um, the styrofoam containers that in the takeout when you take it for restaurants. So I think having like real concrete action so people can say, yeah, this is something we can do and they can do it together and focus on the solution gets people together. And if those activities are already in place, but people are not committed to doing them. Um, so to get people to come to events and to, because what, the reason that I got, in, well, committed, for instance, to like a vegan diet, like the thing that committed me was compassion and was empathy and was knowledge and was my love and kindness for the earth and for the, their inhabitants. So my answer to that is in how I get people to try something new, which I don't force them, I never have ever tried to force anyone to do anything, it just doesn't work, but somehow most of the people that I've known for many years without me trying to do anything have slowly like evolved into just being healthier and more loving. So my short answer after that is just to bribe them, but with, <laughs> but to, bri <laughs> but to bribe them with love, kindness, and compassion, and to spark curiosity in them. I'll just say quickly, the, the best way that I've ever found to motivate and engage people and get them involved um, is to show them that they're needed. Um, and the best way to show them that they're needed, in my experience, is to get yourself in trouble to the degree that you actually need their help. <laughs> get yourself in over your head um, to, to where you need other people to come and help you. That, um, that you are connected to a community of people, whether that's your town, your church, people who care about you. Um, and chances are, those people that you're connected to care more about you than they do about the abstract concept of climate change. And, and that's why your own vulnerability is your greatest strength in, in connecting to others, uh, to arouse their empathy. Um, get yourself into enough of a troublesome situation um, that, that you need them to come and, and rescue you and, and in the process rescue the rest of us. I would suggest that you continue to educate people. And you can do it in, in subtle ways. You could have movie show movie premieres at the lo local libraries or schools. A way to get information out there. People think they know it all, but they don't. And maybe exposing them to more information, teaching them a little bit more, will spark a little bit more um, compassion and, and need to help. And you could invite Sister Anne and Sister Nancy to do Awakening the Dreamer in your parish. <laughs> Hello. Hi. My name is Sarah Rusty, and I'm a student at Salve Regina University. So I just came up to make a comment and probably a challenge to the young ladies on the panel who are going to be going to college soon. So at Solve, we already do composting in our main dining hall. However, this past year, we introduced the hydroponics lab at our school recently introduced composting in your dorm room. So you get a bucket, whatever you want to use, and they give you the supplies, and then you just compost. So all that wasted food that would college students would typically throw in the trash by college students, we waste we go through a lot of food. It's no secret. We have a lot of waste. 
So you just take it and you put it in, in your bucket and then there's be like a collection. I'm not quite sure how it works. I'm not in hydroponics, but my friends who have done it actually love doing it. And it's super easy to be sustainable and be a college student. So I know you're all activists right now, but maybe bring some of like that composting idea to your school and just enact it and just force it to be there and just be present and proud of you guys. Thank you. Thank you. And Dina University, if, if you're not familiar with it, go on their website because they are doing a phenomenal job on sustainability. Their entire cafeteria of food waste is composted. I'm the Ace Martinez Garcia, school sister in Notre Dame. And I have probably a comment or I don't know if a question, but uh, listening to all of you and thank you for sharing your wisdom and experiences and reading this little pamphlet that are on the front that it says, Our earth is hurting. What can we do together? And listening to you and see different generations in the panel, how we can combine. <laughs> the wisdom of each one of us, our experiences, and maybe how we can, if it doesn't exist, or it doesn't exist, how we can be like an intergenerational uh, dialogue, or conversation, or working together, because sometimes we say them and us, and we need to say we. And the other piece is about yesterday, I was listening to some of the, uh, there is the, um, what is the name of this? This is people from Brazil who are talking uh, the this is the Forum of the Indigenous at the United Nations. And there is a group of several people from uh, Brazil talking about the Amazonas, the river, and how it affects. But they were saying something about like, no, because we are too far away from Brazil or from Venezuela, from all these nine countries that share the, the Amazon, the, the Amazonia river. It doesn't affect us. So they want us to, to be aware that we are one, that everything is interconnected. What affects them affects us, or, or vice versa. So the point, well, this is my thing, probably what is, what we can do together is to be aware that we are one. And the other piece, how all the wisdom and experiences that we have, and the different cultures, how we can come together and share. Because that way we are going to be enriched and to get the best of each one of us. So that's my thing. Thank you. I wasn't sure if Marianne wanted to respond about the Amazon. Um, sure. <laughs> um, so as some of you probably know, there's a, a synod on the Amazon the Vatican is going to be holding in um, October. And it's a way to, to focus the Catholic Church worldwide on that very important bioregion of the world. But it's also a lens to look at similar bioregions that are threatened around the world, to really look at how do we um, be in so truly in solidarity with indigenous peoples who have the wisdom and the knowledge of preserving their land and, and wa walking with them. So I would invite people to really pay attention over the next uh, few months, you'll hear a lot of that wisdom coming from the Amazon to our church and then there will be calls coming out of that of how do we um, follow up to that and speak as church in solidarity of the indigenous people protecting their land, protecting their water and protecting the planet for all of us. Darling. It brings me back to how we teach our children, how we teach our grandchildren um, we pass on the, that knowledge and that respect for the land and taking care of it. But in turn, we also have to respect the next generation. The next generation can teach us elders a lot as well. We have to respect, it has to be a mutual respect between all of the generations. Um, and it takes, it, it, you know, it starts at home. It starts with each and every one of us, you know, teaching our own families, it starts there. It certainly doesn't end there, but that's the good place to start. You know, teaching your children, your grandchildren, and being respectful and learning from them as well. Intergenerational solidarity, Pope Francis calls us to. Sally? Mm -hmm. um, 
This is a question for anyone who cares to comment on it, but um, there's a lot of organizational, and not just organizational, belief that the only way that we can sort of force the hand of true change is by massive acts of uh, peaceful direct action or civil disobedience. Uh, which I personally uh, believe as well. And in the last few weeks, we've certainly seen a lot of that in France with the Yellow Vest movement, as well as in the last uh, week, um, it seems like a little bit more, of the Extinction Rebellion people in London. And I'm wondering uh, what you, if you have any specific thoughts about, um, about that. And again, I want to stress non-violent, but wonder if these mass movements that are covered, at least in press outside of this country, more than within, um, if they, if your opinion is that they um, could sort of push things along. Um, I certainly believe that they can, and I think throughout history they're, they're the primary thing that has pushed us along in, in this country. And one of the only things that uh, I think is strong enough to really rattle us out of, uh, whether it's our apathy or, or distraction or um, our day-to-day -day concerns, whatever it is that keeps us sort of focused on, on the status quo, uh, you know, it's, there's so much inertia with, with the path that we're on. Um, and, and it takes serious disruption to push us onto uh, a different path, um, and and throughout our history, and as we're seeing in other places in the world right now, uh, mass civil disobedience and, and resistance, sustained resistance, I think, um, is is a critical part of of doing that, um, and you know, and I think, in some ways, in this in this country, in our movement, we're we're actually hampered by some of the. The organizational control over acts of, of resistance um, that that over the past decade we've certainly had more civil disobedience in the climate movement in this country um, but it has been largely photo op style civil disobedience um, that that is still from a safe position and has a clear end date and is clearly under the control of an organization that um, and so those in power know that they just sort of have to wait this out for a day or for a week or whatever the plan of that action is, um, and they'll go away and things can continue as normal. Um, and that they know that there's an institution that they can negotiate with um, and, and ultimately hold leverage over. Uh, and I think for, for civil resistance to really be revolutionary and, and transformational, it has to get a little bit out of control. I think it still needs to be disciplined um, and to be principled and, and rooted in nonviolence. Um, but but it has to um, it has to be really non-compliance with the system. It has to be it has to show that that we as as a mass of our citizenry are simply not going to allow the status quo to continue anymore. We are refusing to participate in continuing on this path any longer um, and and we haven't gotten to that point in, in this country um, and I don't know that, that that our NGO leadership is capable of getting us to that point um, I think it's I think it's going to have to be built through a different kind of grassroots structure so coming from a youth perspective I think that a lot of younger people are much more willing to be disobedient and to take a, a step and non-violently but often illegally um, and I think that a lot of youth are directionless they feel very passionately about the issue but they don't know how to congregate and how to get together to take action and so I think like we were talking about, about intergenerational dialogue that if we have a better leadership that appeals to young people that we would have a really strong base to have the kind of action that you're looking for. And I think that it's totally possible to get that out of control um, 
action that's going to make a big difference. I think that we also need to make those sacrifices that we were talking about before. Um, stop supporting some of these companies. Make changes in your daily lives and sacrifices. You know, if, if you don't like bottled water, stop buying it. You know, we all talk and talk and talk, but we need to make sacrifices and put some of those words into action. Um, it, one thing that, this is one of the things that drove me crazy, fuel consumption. On my way to work every day, I drive by four schools, and each and every morning I am stuck behind SUV after SUV after SUV with one child in it dropping their kid off for school. And there's also bus after bus after bus after bus that's empty, wasting its fuel. You know, little sacrifices. I stood outside for 15 minutes every morning to get on a school bus. It's where I learned important lessons in life, how to get along with the neighborhood kids, how to think wiser when I got dressed in the morning because it was cold standing out there for 15 minutes. You know, we have to stop running around with pillows under our kids. Yeah. You know, get them on that bus. That fuel is getting used anyway, you know? Or how about the parents that fire up their SUV to drive to the end of the driveway <laughs> while their kids wait for the bus? It's, it, 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 we have to make those common sense changes in our lives, those sacrifices. Most importantly, we need to redefine the word wealth. What is wealth? What is having a big, huge mansion and a big, fancy car and a yacht if you can't breathe the air? Right? That's all stuff. We have to redefine the way that we, we, can, we think of being wealthy. You know, our families are important. Their health is important. The rest of it, not so much. One thing I wanted to go back to, like Kaylee was saying, my generation is clearly more willing to go out and protest. Like, our country's been violent towards schools lately with all the shootings and everything. And I remember, it was after a death of some students that there was a walkout. It was spreading all over social media and Schools and teachers were telling everybody, don't walk out, we'll give you a detention if you dare walk out, you will get suspended, this, this, and that. But they did it anyways, because we didn't want to listen to what they were telling us, because we knew this is what was right. We wanted our voices heard. And in order to get our voices heard, you have to go against what some people are saying. Thank because you, Greta. So I have a question. I haven't heard anyone um, bring up uh, campaign finance or um, lobbying. And I think that the, the corporate world is really running our politics. And uh, I just, that's a question for everybody. I think it's, it may be the underlying question. I personally belong to something called the Organic Consumers Association, the Connecticut Fund for the Environment, and something else that Connecticut does with energy. And I think joining these organizations is good because they really change, uh, they get, but through legislation, through our law, they have made changes, they actually have made changes in our favor. So I think being part of these, supporting them, is number one we could do. The other one out, how we can change campaign finance, because it's been, I think it was an under control at one time, and then it was changed. But with uh, that, all that kind of money coming from big business running our country, we're, it's kind of a hopeless situation. So that's why. That's it. There's still a big move in that move to amend to get money out of uh, finance uh, or government elections. Well, I can't thank you all enough. What a wonderful, wonderful.
And you know, we may not like sacrifice, but I think we have no choice anymore. The choice is ours for the future for these kids. So thank you so much. Everyone should take a stand-up stretch break. <laughs>